Uh, I don't think we're going to go be going back to normal ever. I think the, the workplace has forever changed. And so we're looking at um, the future of the office being something social to satisfy those needs and that ability to get the hell out of your house, get away from your wife and kids, get, you know, get close to uh, uh, people and have a interaction. And so we're thinking about the office more as a country club or a pub than a workplace. I've been very fortunate. So since I started onboarding has kind of been my baby. So I'm very excited about it. But um, we've had a pretty solid onboarding uh, kind of program for all of our new team members. But um, with the switch to uh, doing it uh, distributed, uh, we definitely put a lot more intention into uh, prioritizing connection and uh, building relationships more than anything else. So uh, the fundamentals of our onboarding program have more or less stayed the same over time. We've gotten really, really great feedback about it. Uh, but what we've really focused on is making sure in those first few weeks, people have opportunities to build relationships across departments, get to know different people that they may not usually create, um, ha have opportunities to connect the, with. The people in your company are extremely important to the future of it regardless of whether they're distributed or together. Um, and we have to keep it in mind all the time and you have to continually force your policies and your thinking around it, um, otherwise you'll lose ones. So that we, you are on the right. You are on the right <laughs> Just answering as we're letting people in, but we probably should. I think <laughs> that was a good entry way, Rocky. Thank you. Um, let's kick it off. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christina Kovacevic. Um, I'm the director of people and culture at Aura, but I'm also the general manager of Tenant Talks. Um, we are very happy to be hosting this session as partners of Tenant Talks. Um, it's a virtual series brought by bringing tenants together through innovative problem solving, um, and it's a platform to share valuable tips on workplace trends impacting different industries. We have some very exciting news for Tenant Talks, and as of November, uh, we are actually going global with virtual events in Australia, the US, and very soon Germany. So this is really big. <laughs> topic is navigating disruption in the technology space and we are very pleased to be joined by our panel of industry experts who will share their thoughts and ideas through workplace trends. Before we officially get started, I'd like to introduce Dan Borum, uh, the CEO of Aura, who would like to say a few words. Dan? Yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, you panelists for taking time out of your day to join us and give us your insights and also to the audience for joining. So this is a very exciting time for Tenant Talks. Um, as you know, brought to you by Aura, but it's an exciting movement gaining great momentum where tenants get together. Uh, we'll hear shortly to uh, share their thoughts and ideas and others can take those ideas away and implement them themselves. Um, so that you understand what Aura is, just a bit of a, uh, a plug, is that we're helping organizations efficiently reshape how their space is used in an after COVID world with the different ways of working that have emerged within their team. We look forward to being a, a resource for any one of you. Over to you, uh, Christina. Thanks, Dan. Um, so for those of you listening in today, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we will have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see um, a Q&A icon, um, and that's where you can input your question. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Rocky Uzaki, the founder of Now Work, Rocky, thank you so much for being here today, and I will we'll let you kick things off from here. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. Good to be here, Dan. This is now, I think, my fourth monitoring of a Tenant Talk, and so again, feel very privileged to be here. Um, yeah, I'm the founder and CEO of Now of Work, and, and if you haven't heard of our company, uh, we've all heard the future of work, and we believe the future of work is now. And so we got to stop the narrative of something that's been about to happen at some point. We need to change today. And uh, so our organization doubles down on helping build innovative and naturally agile organizations. And it weaves right into the work that Aura does. So we've had our, our attendees here all probably chomp at the bit here. We're seven minutes in already. So let's get right to it. I'm going to start out with some panelist in, uh, introductions. And so I'll give each of you a minute. If you could tell us, you know, who you are, the organizations you work with, what you even do to give context and of, uh, you know, your space, your size, maybe even when you did your off last office design. So I'll leave it to each of you to give an intro and we'll start off with Jason. Hey everybody, I'm Jason Bailey. I'm one of the founders of Eastside Games, a mobile game company based out of Vancouver. We're 
between uh, uh, contractors and our core staff. We're about 150 people, uh, mostly in and around Canada. Previously, mostly in and around Vancouver until the pandemic came along and uh, spread us all over. Uh, where we make mobile games for iOS, Android, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now that uh, the pandemic is here, um, you know, we've been hiring all over the world and growing really quickly. Uh, we're one of the companies that have been fortunate enough to benefit from the pandemic because everybody's locked in their house and has nothing else to do other than uh, play video games all day. Um, so, so our business is actually doing incredibly well during the, the pandemic. Um, and uh, we were in a process in literally in the 11th hour of signing a uh, massive lease uh, for a huge space that, uh, you know, Dan and his group were going to, or well, were well into helping us design. We're super excited about place was going to be a hundred grand a month. Uh, and uh, luckily we hadn't actually signed that lease. So when the pandemic came, we bailed on that one. Uh, and now, as of last week, we're officially without an office as we sublet the office we did have. Amazing. Yes, Jason, thanks for being here. And the tie-in to COVID and video games is not lost on me for sure. Let's shift it over, uh, over to Keith. You're the industry attraction guest. Now, you're actually welcoming people to offices. So can you give us your intro? Yeah, no, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, so my name is Keith, Keith Metcalf. I'm the CEO of Traction Guest. Uh, we're a company now that has just over 90 people. Uh, we have offices here in Vancouver and we're started in Vancouver. Uh, we also have offices in Dublin and Seattle. And we help big companies get people safely and securely in and out of premises. And pre-COVID, our, our focus was a safe, secure visit. Um, Post-COVID and or during COVID, I guess you could say, we're still focused on that. Um, so we help some of the largest brands in the world. Most of them we can't talk about. Um, because they're sort of secure. But we do have some ones that uh, people would definitely recognize, long list of sort of Fortune 100 companies that we're working with. And our, our mandate for them is to allow them to create processes around getting people on site quickly, safely, and securely. Um, they have a number of reasons they have to do that. So we have 30 plus industries that we serve um, on five continents. They range from essential service manufacturing companies and food manufacturing companies through to tech and large entertainment studios. So we, we sort of run the gamut and all of them need people to get into spaces. And with people, we're expanding that definition from visitors into employees. So now we see organizations seeing employees as a risk um, to meeting with other employees in spaces. And that's a, a sort of a new concept for a lot of individuals. So they're all trying to scramble and find software to help them and processes to help them around that software to do it. And that's what we, that's what we do. Yeah, what a massive opportunity for you guys to do that, that slight pivot and focus as well on employees. So, Keith, thanks for joining us. And over to you, Amanda. Yeah, so I'm Amanda. I'm the Senior Manager of People Operations at Thinkific. Uh, Thinkific is basically an online platform that empowers modern course creators to create, market, and sell their own online courses. Uh, so similar to Jason, we've been very fortunate during the pandemic to have seen a lot of growth. Um, we've just passed 200 team members, uh, so even our current office space wouldn't meet our current needs anymore, and we've become distributed uh, across Canada. My role uh, on the team here is actually to really think about that workplace experience now that we are quite distributed, um, to actually plan for like what that looks like from an operations perspective and how we can empower people to work effectively from home uh, and kind of plan the next steps for our office space. Uh, the funny thing with us is we actually did sign on the dotted line uh, to take over an additional space uh, just before the pandemic. Um, and we're actually in the midst of office renovations right now, which are shortly wrapping up. So uh, we've actually been in the thick of uh, figuring out how we want to design our space. And some of that has changed a little bit with the pandemic and like a little bit of our layout and stuff, but uh, something that's really top of mind for us. And of course, Nick, they had a big raise again. So congratulations to the organizations for killing it through the pandemic as well. So I also want to note, if you guys saw in the advertising, we were also to have Megan, uh, who is the head of people at BBTV, Broadband TV, and she sends her regrets. And so if you've been tracking social media, you probably know what's happening at BBTV. Very exciting stuff. And unfortunately, she is being, uh, being pulled away for some other priorities. So she has left us some snippets of insights I'll share with the group, but that's why she's not here today. Uh, I also, as you guys were introing, I was looking through the audience uh, participation list and whatnot. And what's really clear to me is this. 
judging by the names, we have at least two different category audiences. One are clearly tech companies. And so I suspect they're here because we were so good at collaborating in the tech ecosystem, hearing from leaders like you of what you're doing. We have similar cultures and values and operating systems in tech. So we definitely see a lot of tech people here. But I'm also seeing many people, at, at least that I know of, or I Googled their names here and in, in outside of tech and more legacy or traditional space. And what I think is happening, I know is happening is over the last decade, as technology companies sort of led this charge against and tackling the old paradigm of work, and has COVID accelerated changing how we work, uh, that we're seeing a lot of companies here who are looking for inspiration from tech as, as being the leaders of modern. So give you a little context of who's on this Zoom call today. Let's get into some questions here. I'm going to kick this first question off with Keith. Uh, and what we're really asking is straight up, can you share a significant change your company has made to the office design or team member experience directly in response to COVID. So Keith, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, so we were uh, really early in having our employees work from home. Um, it was a call that we made quite uh, early in, this, in the pandemic. Um, it was purely around their safety, um, just making sure that they you know, had a, a safe uh, work experience, work environment. So that was one of the first things we did. Um, from there, we actually really, given that we're seen as thought leaders in the space, um, we actually brought in some industry experts, one in particular who's worked in a very large company. We hired him onto the team, partially to give us advice on how we could advise our customers to use our software, to invite people before they come, make sure they answer the right questions like health forms, watch videos, understand PPE requirements. And hiring that person was really great because he also brought the ability to give us a really strong playbook on how we would evaluate consistently whether or not we go into the office. Um, and really having some logic behind that, sharing that playbook with the employees so that they would understand it. Um, and even in the surveys we've done around our software, we're finding a lot of companies, that, like 84% of employees in the surveys we've done are worried about going back. 39% of the employees are seeing their employers do nothing about it. So in that playbook, we have specifics around, you know, how we measure the situation, how we actually would have people come in, when they come in. Um, we just opened today, actually, ironically, um, for people who want to, for reasons we can talk about later. Um, you know, what they're able to do in the office, what they're not able to do in the office. All of that is meant to be put in place so that people can see we're taking it seriously, not only with the people we bring on board, but the procedures we put in place. I love that. All those insights and that data, so powerful. Um, Amanda, what, how about yourself? What's the significant change your company has made? Yeah, um, so we went 100% distributed as well. Um, and even with our future hiring, we now have team members across Canada as well. Um, so we are very quick to kind of shut down and make sure that every step of the way, we had really clear communication with our team on our intentions. So uh, our COO, Miranda, was doing weekly updates to share with the team, like what decisions we were making, how we were staying on top of uh, kind of the updates that were happening because we put their safety and security as our, our number one priority. Um, but we also did recognize that with with that kind of significant change, it doesn't really work for everybody. There were probably plenty of team members that have families at home or just really small spaces where just saying our office was 100% shut down uh, really wasn't realistic. So um, we did, in theory, close our office. Uh, so it was not the go-to destination uh, for our team members to work. Uh, but we did make some concessions that we had limited spaces available for those who absolutely needed it, um, just until we kind of like figured out how the dust, dust would settle uh, and what our next steps were. I think there's gonna be a common theme here around really engaging team members uh, through this whole process is what I'm already seeing. Jason, over to you. Yeah, so we went to remote first back in March when everybody shut down um, and we've remained that way until we had a few people attempting to work out of the office at various times and we strongly, strongly discouraged it. Um, I think what's, this, this transition has been really challenging for all of us, uh, not only from a, a personal standpoint and a business standpoint, but from a mental health standpoint. And um, to be fair, you know, especially in the tech industry, we've been talking about this for 10 years, about, you know, uh, working from home part-time, uh, having remote workers, 
uh, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And it seems like, you know, every other month, some major corporation was announcing that they were having a, a work from home or a remote policy. And um, rarely did they talk about how badly it failed. And it almost inevitably failed, to be fair. Occasionally there were success stories, but um, mostly it turned out to be a huge pain in the ass. And I, for one, was always one of the people who was very much against it. I love seeing the faces of people day to day. I want people to see me walking around the office, waving my arms in the air and saying crazy stuff so that they know what the overall vision for the company is and where we're going and what's really going on. And so in a remote setting, you miss all of that and, and you miss what's going on in the office. So, um, and I'll tell you that if we had been, if we had decided to go uh, remote first as a policy on our own of just something that we wanted to do to lead the charge, it would have failed miserably. Our first couple of months were tough. There was a lot of miscommunication. There was a lot of low product productivity. I mean, there was a lot going on in the world and we're all stressed out about a whole lot of things and it was a huge transition and unquestionably it would have failed. But because we had no choice but to make it succeed, um, we were able to. And we made that transition from, um, hey, everybody, you have to work at home because, uh, you know, if you don't, you'll turn into a zombie. Then, you know, you everybody did their best to make that transition. Um, but now we had to make that a certain point. It was always like, okay, another month, another two months, whatever it might be. Um, and it just kind of, the goalpost kept moving. And now here we are six, seven months later and the goalpost keeps moving. And we have no idea when it's gonna go back to normal, whatever that might be. And so we had to make that transition from being, uh, working from home because it's a pandemic to, and, and, and kind of doing your best and us appreciating whatever your best happens to be to making you comfortable and making this permanent. So, so yeah, of course, I would love to go into the office today. Love it. It would be a wonderful place to go. I'd get away from my home. I'd get away from my family. I'd, I'd see something different other than these four walls every day after day. But, um, you know, everybody wants to do that, but it's just not real. So, so we have to, we've asked everybody to make themselves comfortable. We've given them an additional work from home allowance. We are, you know, paying for people's cell phones so that they can, and, and internet connections. So that are sorry, not cell phones, but for their internet connections and giving them an allowance for their cell phone. Um, and, uh, you know, to make sure that they aren't just able to work from home, but they're comfortable and productive working from home. And having a strong, stable internet connection, having a place in your home where you can work quietly and productively is now a requirement for your employment at Eastside Games. Yeah, and I love that. So one of the big thing changes that sounds like you've made in many companies are on that bandwagon is giving that stipend to build an ergonomic place or build a quiet place and have the right technology. And you touched on mental health, which I think we'll probably get to later as well. I've All of the clients or even forget about people I've talked to, this honeymoon's over. A lot of these organizations that were forced into this and how glamorous it was, you're right, Jason, you called what the elephant in the room is. It's not all you know, shiny bells and whistles here. There is some real implications around productivity and serendipitous collisions and the collaboration and socialization that happens in the office. And this is part of the transition that people are realizing, uh, you know, as we get into this or ending the honeymoon. Christine, I think we're going to tee up a quick poll for the audience here and just to find out what their views are on working from home in the future. Why don't we do a quick 30 second poll for everyone? Yep, should come up right now. So I think it's a pretty obvious question here for everyone attending. How many days per week do you want to work from home uh, in the future? I answered too because I want to be part of the game. <laughs> I normally don't get to answer, but I was allowed to as well. <laughs> Anyone want to got 10? Well, we'll give the audience 10 more seconds. Anyone want to take a guess on the results? I'm going to say three to four. Three to four. I see Keith nodding his head as well. Three to four. No, okay. One to two. 
I got that one to two, 44%. Three or four, not, not far behind, but three plus days is 55%. So you could argue the majority is three plus days. And so- Yeah, but I would also argue that people are saying that today because they're desperate to get back into the office because we all miss it so desperately. Mm. I will go work seven days a week in the office if you let me right now. But <laughs> once we get past this uh, missing of the office, I bet you that, that, that if, if we were back for three months, or if you asked that question seven months ago, Yes. Uh, yeah. How often, how much do I want to see my friends and family? Lots right now. And then we'll get back together and we'll fight and then we'll want to go back to our usual once a month. All right. Let's get back to the heart of this, this conversation. The second question I have, and I'm going to start with Amanda, is in the context of office design and the employee experience, what were the biggest hurdles that you faced in the last six months? And like, how did you address them? So Amanda, over to you. Yeah, uh, I think really ensuring that all team members were effectively set up to work from home. Uh, I think when everyone thought it was temporary, we saw a lot of requests for like lap desks and like kind of very easy, like temporary solutions. Um, and over time, we saw that the longer it kind of drew out, um, the reality was people needed a proper desk. Uh, they wanted to have a second monitor and all the equipment that they needed uh, to effectively recreate the type of workspace that they had at our office. So um, it was really ensuring that they were effectively set up from at home and with so many other companies facing the exact same challenges, like there were shortages, there were delays in shipping. Um, we offered a ton of accommodations, especially for our local team members to just go in and pick up that equipment and cover the cost of taxis or evos to be able to pick it up so that they could um, set, set themselves up at home. Uh, I think another big challenge there was, you know, a lot of people, um, their living situations were what they were because they had a space to go to uh, at the office to actually work. So the reality being that some people live in small studio spaces or 400 square feet that setting up a desk and chair to actually work from home and, and working in that space day in, day out uh, maybe wasn't realistic. So figuring out ways to get around that, uh, which was part of the reason that we ended up setting up uh, a calendar booking system and setting up our designating uh, five meeting rooms in our office that people could work out of uh, and making sure that we had all the necessary like safety equipment set up there. So we had masks available, hand sanitizer, signage to make sure that people knew what was expected if they were entering our space so that uh, those that were in those circumstances and couldn't necessarily pick up and move uh, had those as options. Um, and then I also, as I was saying before, we also had office renovations happening. So also kind of uh, keeping in mind that we now had to think about like contractors that were entering our space, how we were working with them, what our timelines were for, for executing that, maybe having to limit even those five people from going into our space um, and going back on our plans to figure out what we actually might need to change if we were to reopen our office or make our space accessible, uh, what that might look like once renovations were actually done. So Amanda, when you, with the, these five meeting rooms, was it first come first serve? Did you have some triaging of people who were actually living in those shoe boxes you discussed? How did you determine who yeah. got first access? Yeah, well, initially when the pandemic started, we had just said, okay, you know, limited number of people going in, but it was really hard to monitor. And some people were working at their desks and we couldn't sanitize everything. So um, we actually just used Google Calendar and it was a first come first serve booking system. You booked it for the entire day, even if you're only there for a half day, um, just because at least that way we could make sure that our cleaners were going in each day to these rooms to disinfect and um, didn't necessarily want to bring someone in just midday to, to do that. And we obviously wanted to make sure that uh, things were being done pr properly uh, to disinfect. So it was, it was first come first serve. We started out with five and we saw it working really well. Um, and now as we're planning to kind of uh, go forward from here, uh, we're actually gonna be increasing that to uh, 10 different meeting spaces uh, based on also growing our team uh, and actually looking to add two of our larger meeting room spaces where we can accommodate up to six people uh, with all the right social distancing measures uh, to make sure that we can um, meet the needs of our team after the survey that we did, which they, they really want opportunities to like meet and have spaces to go. So uh, we're scaling and kind of making a slow transition to reopen, but not making it mandatory to go to the office. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Amanda. So Jason, I know you shared some of your the impediments along the way, but what other challenges did you face and how did you guys address them? One of the biggest challenges is uh, onboarding new people. As you know, we've been seeing to grow through this time dramatically, uh, but um, you know, it was easy when somebody would come into the office, you could walk them around and introduce them to everybody and set them up on their little desk with all the equipment they needed. And now, you know, for IT, it's a real challenge because there are, um, you know, supply chain issues. So even just getting 
a MacBook from the Apple store is not as trivial as it used to be. Uh, you know, I ordered a new machine a few weeks ago. I'm still waiting for it. Um, you know, we try to stay ahead of these things, make it so we're, we're having to stagger and slow down our onboarding process. And we're not able to hire as many people as quickly as we uh, traditionally would have. Uh, and then also, you know, I have this issue where I, 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 I jump in a meeting and I look at all the faces on the Zoom chat and I look around and I go, I don't know who any of these people are. Like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? And you don't have that personal relationship with them as you run into them in the kitchen and uh, talk about how much the Canucks suck. Uh, in front of the water cooler or, or you know, you begin to, to build a personal relationship with them. And that's much more challenging when the only interactions you have are um, through this. So we're trying to address that going forward. Um, I don't expect the pandemic to be over anytime soon. Uh, I don't think we're going to go be going back to normal ever. I think the, the workplace has forever changed. And so we're looking at um, the future of the office being something social to satisfy those needs and that ability to get the hell out of your house, get away from your wife and kids, get, you know, get close to uh, uh, people and have a interaction. And so we're thinking about the office more as a country club or a pub than a workplace. So it's a place that you might go um, three or four times a month. It's a place where you'll go and have big meetings with your whole team to have some kind of team building, big sprint planning type meetings. But it's not a place you go every day. You don't need to, uh, you know, pack up your car, hit the Starbucks, drive 45 minutes, find a place to park, uh, go upstairs in an elevator, say hi to everybody, and then sit down at a desk and answer your emails. You can do that from home. You don't need to leave the house to do that. But every once in a while, you want to come to the, the pub, so to speak, uh, and where there will be lots of seating, uh, games, fun stuff, good food, good coffee, uh, meet with your team, have that social bonding, feel like you're a family, um, but only do that maybe once or twice a month, or for some people only every once or twice a quarter, uh, and other people might be there more often. Yeah, but jumping ahead to one of our, obviously our next questions, but just, just circle back real quick. So you identified that the social aspect has been maybe diminishing particular onboarding. Have you seen any successes in the virtual world where you're able to recreate connections or at least to some degree, any successes within your company? Yeah, we do, uh, we do a few things. We do uh, a Wednesday lunch and learn, which I skipped today to hang out with you guys, where uh, the entire studio uh, is expected to be there. Um, there's little presentations from various different teams of what they're doing on. We celebrate, uh, uh, anniversaries, uh, introduce new hires to people. So we do that every Wednesday. We also have a Friday cheer, where at the end of the day at uh, 4.30 on every Friday, we often have a DJ who will come into the Zoom chat, um, have a quick little kind of congratulations to anything exceptional that happened that week, give a cheers to you know somebody within the organization or a team within the organization. And we also have um, casual coffee chats. So first thing Monday morning, we have at 9 o'clock, we have a, a, a coffee chat where anybody from the studio is welcome to join. The founders are always there. Uh, and it's a change. Usually there's anywhere from kind of 12 to 25 people there. Usually it's the founders doing most of the talking because we're loud mouths. Um, but it's a, it's a social time where you can kind of come in and just talk shop and talk about what's going on in your lives, make some jokes, talk about how much the Canucks suck. And then yeah. uh, recreate that water cooler. Yeah, I was just going to say that's recreating those serendipitous type conversations and making it optional, not a mandatory. I think it's the best practice. I'm gonna, I got to get to Keith, who's been quiet here. But Amanda, yeah. just I, I, before I get to you, Keith, I just Amanda I was thinking about orientation. I know you just hired Tracy McDonald, who's superstar, by the way, and she was raving on LinkedIn about the onboarding process and just that welcoming. Was that something you've always done, or was that something new because of the COVID experience? Yeah, uh, we've been very fortunate. So since I started onboarding has kind of been my baby. So I'm very excited about it. But um, we've had a pretty solid onboarding uh, kind of program for all of our new team members. But um, with this switch to uh, doing it uh, distributed, uh, we definitely put a lot more intention into uh, prioritizing connection and uh, building relationships more than anything else. So uh, the fundamentals of our onboarding program have more or less stayed the same over time. We've gotten really, really great feedback about it. Uh, but what we've really focused on is making sure in those first few weeks, people have opportunities to build relationships across departments, get to know different people that they may not usually create um, 
ha have opportunities to connect with. Uh, so what we we switched to actually as of September was actually doing a lot more cohort onboarding. Uh, so we hire people in groups now. Um, that way, they immediately they kind of have a few people that are going through that process with them and uh, having people to connect with. Um, we really help them get to know our product early on. So everyone builds a course to learn like that experience, uh, and then we actually have them dive into our support as well. So doing that together and really being able to connect directly with our customers. Um, it's been like a great uh, plan overall, but uh, we also do meet and greets kind of ongoing afterwards. So uh, we put it on new team members. We kind of give them a list of like, here are top people that you might want to connect with. Here are some people you might uh, be working with over time to actually help them create those connections and uh, find opportunities to get to know different people. That's so great, Amanda. Huge kudos out to Thinkific. Keith, we haven't forgotten about you. The floor is absolutely yours, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift the questioning because I think we've beat that one. Is in terms of your organization, like what kind of safety measures or have you put in place for both physical and we've talked about now mental well-being as well as you're welcoming you know, staff and team members back to the office? Yeah, I think the mental piece of what's going on for employees is absolutely huge and We've seen the struggle with that, being like a highly culture-oriented organization. When you separate, uh, you, you, start, you start realizing that we invested a lot of money and time historically as companies to get people together from a culture perspective. You think of the number of team building events that people would do, um, the number of things that they would do from a company perspective, all of that became more of a challenge. And I think like a lot of companies, we certainly got into the moment, right? Because we, we do have a lot of relevance right now for companies and you get into the moment of being relevant and doing what you need to do to be relevant as a company. And it's easy to forget the importance of that. So one of the things we actually got some feedback from employees is that they wanted to see improvements on ways that we could do culture differently and better. And it's, it's funny from a management team perspective, I think it's really an easy thing to say, okay, well, hey, we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic. So what we had to do as a management team is say, let's not say what's, what are the obstacles of the pandemic. Um, it's more of like creatively, how do we take this new problem down? And since then, we've seen some really good ideas come out of the employees. So we started a culture committee so that they can talk about this and not only talk about ideas that get people connected, because I think the connectedness is the piece that people are missing. It's also, how do we do that in a safe manner? And then how do we talk about it? So that committee is just kicked off. So we're gonna have you know, a lot of the employees uh, leave that off. The other thing is people wanna learn. That's one way they connect. So we created a, a Friday session. Uh, it's called, um, you know, Traction Guests Friday, TGIF. Um, so it's sort of a fun little naming thing. Um, but the neat thing for that is we've brought, we're starting to bring in outside speakers, people who can talk to the company about different topics, such as, uh, mental health. Um, that's, that's, we just had a speaker come in and talk about the, ta uh, the idea of resilience. How do we as individuals build up our resilience so we can stay in this sort of window of um, you know, resilience that allows us to focus, enjoy doing what we're doing, and connect with people in a, in a world where we're not really set up to you know, connect virtually. It's very difficult. So I think the neat thing for us is that um, we're seeing, because of the space we're in and working with a lot of these security and health specialists um, who are all trying to answer these problems, we're seeing a ton of innovation. And I think that's what you're hearing from Jason, you're hearing from Amanda, is that there's innovative ideas that come out of struggles. And that doesn't mean that they're gonna be easy. The evolution of everything is difficult, but what comes after is going to be impressive. And our current view is that the world is still gonna need connection. We're absolutely social primates. We're primates who need to interact, will continue to need to interact um, in whatever world this looks like. So our view is that we're heading towards a hybrid. And I think there's been some good discussion around what that hybrid might look like. And, and we sort of have similar views and we see some really big companies sort of vectoring around the same idea. Now with that hybrid of home and work and maybe those merging together, we see more complexity around physical spaces, not less. We see more struggles on being able to say, are we at capacity at one location? Not fire capacity, but COVID capacity, which could change um, at a moment's notice, right? And what is the purpose of that space? So there's been some good discussions around that as well. So the irony for us is that we actually see large organizations maybe moving from centralized offices um, that are large and you know, sort of dictate people to come into one space to more decentralized offices allowing them to have more flexibility, less commute times and other things. That all ties into safety as well, if it's done right. 
but I think culture and safety have to come together as well as performance and, and intention of what you're trying to be as a company in this period in time. Oh, totally. So I hope you guys can hear me. I've had lots of feedback. I even have people texting me. So dude, you're, you're, I don't know, some of the microphone rubbing my shirt. So I hope I've taken it off. Hope you can still hear me. It's gone now. I apologize. Keith, I love TGIF first. I hope, you know, people like jump on that bandwagon, but I also agree with that innovation comment. You know, we were so complacent as, as, as a society around work, et cetera, we got comfortable and it took a pandemic to awaken a lot of people. And there's just so much opportunity to challenge the old status quo, to, op, to chat, to capitalize on, on new innovations and, and opportunities out there. And that's, I hate to say it this way, but it's kind of like that gift of COVID is really to help us rethink not just work, but our lives. And I think that's a lot of innovation things that you're talking about. Um, let's get into another poll, Christina. I believe we're going to like to pull the audience on on, uh, just about the future office space. Be up in a couple seconds. So this is a, a question. I mean, you don't have to be the owner or the CEO of the organization, but given the impact of COVID, is having is, is having on work. What do you feel is most likely affect on your office space in the future? So Keith was talking about hybrid. So let us know. Do you think there's no change? Are you upsizing, downsizing? What are your thoughts? Let's give them 20 seconds to fill that out. Amanda, can you give me a thumbs up or down? Can you hear me okay? Is it okay without my, okay, awesome, thanks. You're good. Okay, Christina, let's close the poll and share the results. So it looks like our majority are in the downsize and relocate. Uh, in fact, I was, well, there's 53%. The majority have downsized in some context in the future. Interesting. Okay, so let's get into our, our next question here. I'm going to go back to Amanda. And so now we're starting to project the future in, in, along with that poll question. So as we look into and plan for a year from now, so we talk about if that vaccine is readily available, what purpose will the physical office fulfill? What might it look like or what can or cannot change? Uh, and we know that uh, we've got some already some country club talk, but Amanda, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think fundamentally the purpose of an office is going to shift. And, and to be honest, I think we saw this kind of happening even before the pandemic. Um, even for people that have office spaces, they love working at co-working spaces. They love going to coffee shops. And I think fundamentally people like the diversity of having different spaces to work in different environments to be able to do their best work. Um, so in my mind, uh, what I found was a kind of the, the number one reason that people came to our office was uh, the ability to actually collaborate collaborate, uh, to congregate, to actually uh, connect. It was more about the social aspects of it. When you actually asked, why do you like coming to the office? It was always more about uh, the social interactions and, and those points of connection versus I like coming in to sit at my desk nine to five and, and, and work there. Uh, so I think fundamentally, um, you know, it's kind of shifting uh, its purpose. Um, and the way that I've always kind of described thinking about your office space is kind of like how you would think about your house. Like every room should have a purpose. And I think fundamentally, if people are, are leaving their homes which is that space where you can kind of be heads down work in your sweatpants or your pajamas uh, and you're going into the office typically it's it's for a purpose and uh, we started to design our space with that in mind so we have rooms that are really for like brainstorming and collaborating where it's whiteboard on all walls, it's comfortable seating, it, it's it's uh, creating a space for creativity. We have uh, spaces that have uh, the ability to connect with people uh, kind of across Canada, uh, but have the whiteboards, have the TV, have like the setup so that, you know, if you're making decisions or you, you want to present, uh, it makes it easy to do that. Um, so I think for us, it's kind of thinking about it more as like a hybrid where people fundamentally will likely be working from home. We also have a distributed team now, so we're across Canada. Uh, but really focusing going forward on thinking about our office spaces as more co-working type spaces where you drop in uh, for a purpose and uh, likely what we're going to see in the next year or two uh, if we continue to grow that uh, we're going to be opening up offices with that same mentality kind of across Canada and even internationally too. You mean working Monday to Friday, nine to five in a cubicle doesn't work? <laughs> no, it, it's, I honestly think it's crazy that like 30 or 40 years ago, like the offices, like everyone was working in private offices. Then we kind of switched to the open work concept and that didn't really work. And I think fundamentally we're getting to this place now where it's like, 
every place that you work needs to have a purpose and you need to be able to do different types of work. Oh my gosh, 30, 40 years ago, companies still do that today. But it was, so I think those are key takeaways. It's got to be intentional. There's going to be intentional use of space, make it feel like home and social plays a key role. Keith, what are your thoughts on this? It's funny. I, I don't know. We actually just signed right before the pandemic with uh, the Aura team as well. So we're just finishing up our office build out. And one of the things that we came from was a space where the desks were free form, pretty close together, sort of standard tech kind of setup. Um, we actually had a decision to make. We actually had some great um, existing desks that were more cubicle style. And the irony is when we work through that, it's like people want to have some separation from each other now. They want to have a space that they know is theirs. You know, they don't have a bunch of people floating in and out. Um, so we actually decided to keep the cubicles, um, as well as the fact that we were finding in an open environment, there were complaints around people being able to be creative and focused and thinking clearly because they were all, you know, so close together or talking so closely and over top of each other. So I'm really interested to see how it works out. I mean, we're, we're fortunate in that they're really good setup and, and they, it's very spacious and comfortable. And we also have the lease space to actually provide dedicated spaces per individual. So we don't have to hot desk. Um, people can come in right now and then they can continue to use their space without other people coming in. So I don't know, I think the jury's out. I imagine that there's a number of uh, furniture manufacturers out there um, who are really trying to figure out in this new normal, are we going towards enclosed spaces that are for individuals or open spaces where people can mill around? Um, it'll probably be a combination of there of that, but I think the jury's out on that one. Uh, personally, I can tell you I like the idea of going into my own area and it not having a bunch of people in it um, or people floating in and out of it anymore. I like the idea that I could come in there and that could be mine, um, but that's that's me and and we'll we'll continue to experiment and get feedback from our employees on it. I love that, Keith. Yes, we have dissent. And so you, we live in a hyper-personalized world, period. We know this is how we, we talk about team member centricity and customer centricity and, and choice and, and hyper-personalization. And I think that's part of that culture piece too. There is no right culture. When you know the type of organization you have, what your people want, give them the choice, let them personalize. And you're going to find that every different company may be just a little bit different. So I agree the jury's still out. We'll see what's best for companies, but there is no secret sauce, uh, you know, one size fits all. Uh, we're going to get to rapid uh, question in a second, but Megan wanted to share some thoughts on this question. So remember Megan um, from BBTV, she said that she wanted to share her top piece of advice would be, to the extent that it's possible, include your team members in the decision of the future office experience. Ask them many, many times and ask them often. often. Uh, reason being is that they too are in the middle of this evolution and their perspectives and needs will most certainly have changed from the beginning of this pandemic, for example, till now. And they'll likely change again in short order. The future of work in this regard must be nimble and inclusive for the best outcome uh, in this ever-changing world we live in right now. Also, how exciting that we literally get to shape the future of work through our work. So Keith, I really talked about what you said. This is iterative. We're going to learn and, and we'll see what happens in the next three, six, nine, 12 months. Okay, let's get to rapid fire. So for the audience, if you haven't participated in this before, this is where we ask our panelists a question and they get... 10 seconds to give us a response. So we're gonna start with Jason. You can kick off the, uh, the first question is, are the changes we're seeing to the office design and experience the new normal, e.g. are we never going back? We're never going back, no way. The, the only reason we were doing it is because we never were forced to change in this first place. We're still doing what they were doing in the 1940s when they invented the telephone was a revolutionary new thing in the office. We're never going back. Keith. Um, I, I am reserving some judgment on saying never um, because I, I don't know. Um, and I would say that there's some recent things we're seeing from companies like Netflix and others where they're starting to make some very uh, clear observations that there's a lot of downsides to being completely distributed and not able to work together all the time um, or it, at moments. Now, I will agree. I think that this moment has taught a lot of us that we can evolve and we can have a different way of working. Um, but I'm not gonna say, I, I wouldn't say at this point that it's never gonna go back to having some people working together in spaces. I think it'll just be different. Um, okay. So I, I wouldn't go that far. All right, Amanda. 
Uh, I'd say no. I think we always need spaces to meet and connect. Uh, so moving more towards that kind of co-working environment. So having that hybrid uh, kind of approach with distributed first. Okay. Again, rapid fire, quick response. Amanda, we'll start with you this time. What's the biggest surprise or learning you've gained through this COVID experience? Uh, I think fundamentally the resilience of people and really being able to adapt to ever-changing circumstances where there is no end goal or future plan. Jason? People want to do well. People want to perform. And, and uh, uh, given the opportunity, they will, will give some time to adapt, they will. Love it. And Keith? Um, I would say uh, the people in your company are extremely important to the future of it, regardless of whether they're distributed or together. Um, and we have to keep it in mind all the time. And you have to continually force your policies and your thinking around it. Um, otherwise, you'll lose ones that, that you don't want to. Amen to that. Okay, and our last rapid fire before we go to audience questions, we'll start with Keith. What's the one golden nugget advice that you'd like to share about the future of office design and experience to our audience? Um, it will be different, um, at least in the near term. In the long term, we'll see the memory of humans and um, how long it spans. It's not our first pandemic, and we still see people kissing each other in regions as a form of greeting, uh, which you would never imagine would be the case. So um, the, there's definitely well-demonstrated behaviors where we need to connect with each other. Keep it in mind. The connection's important. Um, allow people to do that. And I like Amanda's point around involving them in the process because they have better ideas often, I've learned, than me and the rest of my leadership team. So keep an open ear. Totally. Amanda? Uh, I'd say focus on creating uh, spaces with a purpose. So just like at home, you probably wouldn't sleep in your kitchen. Don't expect people to work at a desk nine to five. And finally, Jason. Uh, I think don't expect people to work in the city is gonna be the biggest change that we'll see is, is you know, I'm already, of our, you know, 100 odd people, uh, we've already had a dozen of them move out of the city. And I think that's where we'll really see some shift. All right. Christina, why don't we turn over the last 10 minutes or so here? I know it was at least a few questions there. Do you want to get to those? So as Christina reads them, unless if it's not directed to a specific panelist, whoever would like to jump in and answer it, feel free to do so. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have a good selection of questions. The first one I'll start off with. Um, and Jason, you touched on this because um, you do offer this to employees, but do any of you provide a stipend for employees to purchase better chairs or furniture um, when working from home? Um, and sort of the question ties in is how important is health and wellness um, in fostering an evolving workplace? So I'll, I'll kind of reiterate what I already said earlier. The health and wellness is very important to us and we want to make sure that people aren't just um, able to work from home, that they're comfortable working from home and able to be productive. So we've given them a stipend. Um, wherever possible, we took furniture from our office and sent it to their homes because the last thing the world needs is more garbage. So wherever possible, it's, it's absolutely imperative that you make people comfortable in their homes. And hopefully now, as we'll see, is people will be able to... Um, if this becomes a new norm, you know, move a little bit farther out of the city, get a bigger place where they can have a separate room uh, and, and continue to be productive. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. One of the things we've done too in, in realizing this is that uh, on the comfort piece, because we actually sent all of our people who spend a lot of time on, the, on Zoom with external customers a kit where they have their own camera, a light, you know, a background, a green screen, um, just so that they, there's, I think there's going to be some interesting studies about staring at yourself um, that come out of this um, and watching yourself talk all the time. I don't know what's going to come out of it, um, whether we're all going to have weird twitches in the future or something, but something's coming out of that. And if you're going to have to stare at yourself, stare at your best self, um, and also uh, let your customers and prospects also stare at their best selves. Um, so that, that's one of the small things we've done. Um, I think another would be, um, you know, just keeping in mind that the good ideas come out of people in those committees and listening to them. Um, so those are sort of what some of the, the things that we're thinking about right now. Oh, good, Keith. Like right. the... Go ahead, Amanda. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, we did the stipend too, but we've also uh, added like a $500 uh, personal spending account for our team too, to actually be able to retrofit their space with some of those like nice add-ons that uh, maybe wouldn't be included or to purchase an air conditioner if your home is too hot or, or really uh, great headphones. So um, we not only had the budget for your actual workstation, but the additional kind of step above to help them customize it and make it their own. Yeah, and the, and the number I'm hearing the most, by the way, is a thousand dollars per person. We do, we do a little bit more than that. We and we we also sent people a box of swag, so that uh, unlike myself who didn't because I'm lazy, uh, can hang it up and have it in their space, so that they're like much like he's you know you have a space that's customized and feels like he's like games. Uh, one of our employees even went so far as to. I uh, get some of the art and stuff and kind of recreated a mini Eastside Games in their uh, laundry room, which is now their office. Love it. Love it. All right, Amanda, more questions? Uh, yeah, let me just open this here. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll jump to one more before we wrap up. Um, and let me see here. With no physical interaction in an office setting, what is the state of your company's culture? Uh, our our company has our culture has kind of more or less stayed the same I think um sometimes and it's the reality of switching to like connecting digitally like it's very it's much easier to do it in person especially if you're passively meeting people or walking by somebody in the hall um but we've tried to do a really good job of making sure that we create those feelings of connection so it starts right from our onboarding um so that means our new team members are able to meet uh older team members and vice versa so constantly building those connections we've got a lot of different workshops and stuff that happen uh, in smaller groups and kind of larger groups as well. Uh, we use a donut integration for Slack that pairs people up in groups of two or three uh, to really help them connect. Uh, we actually have an entirely social channel, a lot of different Slack channels where people can join based on interest groups. And we found um, that's really brought people together, especially across Canada, uh, to really connect with common interests. Yeah, I would say it's super hard to measure and, and, and it's, it's, it's not easy, right? Because you can talk to somebody who's working from home and say, hey, this is great. Um, I had one of our developers come into the office today. Um, we just opened it up just for people who need to find a space. Like they may have kids at home, roommates, other things going on. And they're just, you know, like, I'm, he's like, I'm so glad to be here. Um, and, and I needed it. Um, so one of the things we've done is we've rolled out a, a tool recently that actually allows people to tell us how they're doing on increments. So they just quickly, you know, put their inf information in. We just rolled this out. And I think that's going to be really helpful because then we can sort of identify teams and pockets where we need to do some work. Uh, because otherwise you sort of are doing your best um, without knowing. And, and, you know, obviously measurement helps a lot. So that's one of the things we're, we're really looking forward to seeing some data on that. So we can target some of our efforts. Um, besides the generic efforts that we're trying and then, you know, the ideas that come out of the committee, which we're going to give a budget and allow them to, to come up with some things um, to deploy that budget. Christina, can we just get to one quick question, like really quick for everyone, because we've mentioned Slack, Keith sort of mentioned a tool, I think it's okay to plug it when it was. There's a question about what technologies that you guys are deploying to ensure productivity communication. Can you guys all quickly share what you're using that's effective? Yeah, Better Me is the one that um, I was speaking of. It's B-E-T-T-R dot M-E. Um, so and it's a local uh, Vancouver company that created that one, uh, but anyway, traction on demand. Okay, so I've heard Slack, for Better Me. What other tools are you guys using? We've used Miro uh, as kind of like a whiteboarding tool. So uh, the two different kind of thought processes that we have is we use Miro, which is more of like a visual tool. Uh, but a lot of our team members even just simply use Google Docs during meetings to kind of track meeting notes and uh, have points of discussion or ask questions to prepare. So uh, Google Suites has been super helpful for us, especially like calendar and time management. Um, we're also experimenting with a tool right now called Clockwise that helps with calendar management to help uh, block off times for lunch and focus time. And it uh, automatically shifts events around based on your availability and how many focused hours you want each week to optimize your schedule. So uh, something that we're testing out right now and prior to that we were using a tool called Olive uh, to make sure that people were getting autoresponders and updating their Slack to communicate their availability um, so that they could really get that productive kind of heads down time that they need. Thank you. And there's Miro and Mural. There's two. They're both whiteboard. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Two M -I -R we use the M-I-R-O yeah, <laughs> tool. Mural. But Mural is good as well. Jason, yeah. any last uh, technology you want to share? 
Uh, no, we use, we use Slack and Google Docs and the Google Suite a lot. Uh, the only thing I would add is that we do a monthly survey on people's you know, mental health and feelings around the office and what's working for them, what's not working for them. And we do that every single month and have since the pandemic started so that we can track change over time. So, you know, we're, we're a bunch of data. Um, and so, you know, we, we're, we're deep in it. Yeah. And people can use whatever the type forms, uh, survey monkeys, whatever free even. Okay, Christine, I know we're butting up against the hours. So back over to you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you again to our panelists, um, Amanda, Keith, and Jason. And Rocky, as always, thank you for leading us through this discussion today. Um, for all attendees, you should receive a short survey after we close. Um, we would love to hear your feedback on the event. Um, and with that, let's wrap it up. Have a good day, everyone. And thank you for joining. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay, bye. Thank you.